Well, hello everyone. Welcome back. Look, I noticed um, I used an old photograph there. My son said that's 20 years old. But I noticed that Mary Ann did the same thing in the program here. And uh, so she's the president, she's allowed to do that. So look, thank you very much to the organizing committee for inviting me again to experience traditional Filipino hospitality. Um, I'm told that this is my third time here, probably my last. As a male pediatric infectious disease specialist, I see I'm a dying breed. Vicente and I are probably the token males here, and all the rest are women. The women, women rule the world, yes? Look, when I come to these meetings, I always bring a bag. So you know you come to a meeting and everyone has exactly the same bag given out, okay? And then you put your bag down and now you can never find it again because it looks just like everyone else's bag there. So I always have a special bag with me. And this is the bag. It's a very beautiful bag that I was given. And it has the sponsor's logo there, but I put black over that because I'm not allowed to be have a sponsor. Okay, and this bag, I look inside, and it says, Manila 2001. <laughs> so, and it was this Pitsby meeting in Manila 2001. So that's when I first came here. And then when I arrived at the hotel, they said, welcome back. And I said, have I been here before? And they said, yes, you came here in 2011. So I was the speaker here in 2011. So I'm another frequent flyer, I'm afraid. Look, I want to thank Dr. Thelma and colleagues who took me to the Tal Volcano yesterday. Um, Dr. Vicente talked about cruelty to animals and I felt very sorry for the poor horse that was taking me up the crater. The horse was smaller than me. I'm only little, I have to put the microphone down, but still my legs were almost touching the ground. And every time we passed a rock, I had to lift them up. Anyway, it was quite an experience going to the Tal Volcano. If you haven't been there, they try and kill you three ways, you know? They try and kill you on the drive there, and then on a boat journey that's, and then up the mountain and down again on a horse. So, usually, it's better to invite people to go to the volcano after they've given their talks, just in case they don't get back, okay? Look, finally, I would like to thank you, the audience. I'm told there are 2,700 participants here for this meeting. That's extraordinary. For the World Society of, Infectious, of Pediatric Infectious Diseases meeting, we're pleased if we get 1,500. Okay, so there are more of you here than at the World Congress last year. Look, I'm going to talk about neonatal infections. That's my area, one of my areas. I'm an infectious disease specialist, but I'm particularly interested in neonatal infections. And you'll know that with the Millennium Development Goals, one of the targets was to bring down childhood deaths of children under five years. And we've achieved that worldwide, but neonatal deaths have decreased declined at a slower rate than older children. And now 40% of deaths of children under five years of age are newborns, neonates, okay? And of those, the major causes are perinatal asphyxia, but also neonatal infections. So it's a hugely significant and rather neglected topic. When I was training in pediatric infectious diseases ago, more years ago than I care to remember, my boss said to me, you need to get a specialty, something that's your area. Well, for those of you training now, neonatal infectious diseases is the one. There are very few people, so they won't be able to argue with you. You'll be the expert. You can do lots of research, lots of really interesting teaching, and uh, help with treatment. So neonatal infectious diseases. Let's talk about that and what's new. 
So first of all, um, I have to thank my wife, because today is our 37th wedding anniversary, okay? Yeah. And so I have to thank her for allowing me to come here. I completely forgot when I agreed to come, and she didn't, and I'm still alive, which is even more hazardous. And that's her. This is Carmel. Um, she has red hair, and um, all my children have red hair. Um, we're said to be like the Weasley family from Harry Potter. <laughs> the house looks a bit like that as well. And when someone came in, they went, oh, how nice, the Weasley house. So, and this is my, oops, I'm always doing this. There's a mover, isn't there? Oh, well, never mind. I'll do this. So this is my um, first and only grandson, Charlie. And I hope you're not as bored as he is by my talk. <laughs> okay. And this is my daughter, Anna, who's a surgeon in training, and her partner, Peter. Okay, so the clinical scenario I've been asked to discuss by the organizing committee um, is this story of a full-term neonate who was born asphyxiated. His mother had a urinary tract infection in the third trimester. By the way, I notice everyone here uses initials all the time, you know. Three, and I don't understand any of them, so I tell everyone, try not to do that. And now I've used one myself. A urinary tract infection in the third trimester. And initially the baby was treated with ampicillin and amikacin, and I presume the baby was also treated for asphyxia. I'm not told whether the baby was cooled, as you would nowadays in many places, um, if it was significant asphyxia. Okay, so let's just stop and think about this. So empiric treatment of possible sepsis is when you start treatment before you know what the organisms are. And we tend to distinguish early sepsis from late sepsis. And that's because you often have different organisms, not always, in some countries you have very much similar organisms, but they're often different organisms and they're acquired in different routes, aren't they? So in early sepsis, usually the baby is acquiring the organism through the amniotic fluid, going in through the lungs, so they commonly get pneumonia early, maybe with septicemia as well. And we tend to use, we talked about using narrow spectrum if you possibly can, but covering the likely organisms. So ampicillin or penicillin for the gram-positive organisms, and ampicillin will cover some of the gram-negative. And then usually it's recommended, the WHO still recommends gentamicin for gram-negative organisms, although as you know, with antibiotic resistance, that's not gonna be sensible in all parts of the world. And one of the major problems is these extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing organisms. So they're producing an enzyme that degrades beta-lactamases, which includes ampicillin, penicillin, cephalosporins. Okay. And some of these extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing organisms also are gentamicin resistant. So maybe this is why you had to use amikacin. That's what I'm presuming was used, amikacin. And so that, if that's what's likely in your area of the, the world, then that's important to know what's going on for, to make that choice of ampicillin and amikacin. Now the next thing I noticed that oral feeds were started on the second day of life. Now I'm an infectious disease physician, but I'm a little bit scared, depending on how asphyxiated the baby was, to start oral feeds in that setting. Because this baby's at some risk from necrotizing enterocolitis, no? But anyway, we're depending on whether the baby can tolerate these oral feeds, they're started, so I'm not gonna argue with that. But a day later, the baby gets abdominal distension, hypothermia, poor activity, and they're worrying about necrotizing enterocolitis, of course. And when you have necrotizing enter enterocolitis, you have damage to the bowel wall, organisms can get through that bowel wall and cause septicemia, so there's a concern about enteric organisms, bowel organisms causing sepsis, and the ampicillin was stopped, not unreasonably, and keftazidine and metronidazole were added to the amikacin. So the basis for that is to give you better coverage of pseudomonas, presumably, and other gram-negatives, but particularly pseudomonas, 
because cefotaxime is inactive against pseudomonas, and the metronidas are, of course, for anaerobes. So oral field feeds were stopped. I didn't know whether there was an abdominal x-ray done, but of course you would have done that to look for necrotizing enterocolitis. Now the baby remained hypothermic and had decreased activity. And after two days, the antibiotics were changed to meropenem and vancomycin. This is the story I'm told. Do I agree with that? Well, what are we treating? Are we treating necrotizing enterocolitis, NEC, or are we treating sepsis? And if so, what are the culture results? Are we going to change antibiotics if the baby's still looking sick, but the cultures are negative? Further progress, well, perhaps you were right and I was wrong. I wouldn't have changed the antibiotics, but after you've changed the antibiotics, the baby's activity improves, the abdomen is soft, the distension has resolved. Maybe that would have happened anyway, but, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating to an extent. So we'll say, good, you were right, I was wrong. Okay, but then after three days on meropenem and vancomycin, this poor baby develops tachypnea and hypothermic episodes. So now we're in day eight of this since the baby was born. I hesitate to say day eight of life, which lots of people say, because when does life begin? It's a fraught, uh, possibly nine months and day eight, if you know what I mean. So, okay, so hospital acquired pneumonia and sepsis were suspected. And the question to me was, is fungal infection a possibility? Would you start antifungals now? And would you give prophylactic antifungals? in this circumstances, well, at least when is it warranted? Okay, so we need to think about those sort of act likelihoods. Okay, what was the chest x-ray appearance? I don't know. So we we'll just talk about the likelihood that this was fungal infection because the source, the, one of the things that um, the organizers wanted me to talk about was fungal infection. But first of all, let's just think, what's the differential diagnosis for this episode, which we heard was, um, was respiratory, or at least there was tachypnea and hypothermia. Um, so, first of all, it could be non-infectious, okay? Is the baby having seizures as a result of the perinatal asphyxia? Um, is this something else that's going on here? But um, is, the acid, is it baby got tachypnea because of acidosis? I don't know all of those things, and we obviously would need to look at that. But if we're going to concentrate on the infectious side of it, and when I do ward rounds, I do regular ward rounds twice a week um, on two different neonatal units, just to keep in touch with neonatal infections, and all the time I just think, are they missing an infection here? Or they ask me, what should we be doing? Okay, so there's a possibility of a virus infection here. Um, influenza virus will look like this. Respiratory syncytial virus will look like this. Other respiratory viruses we heard about um, in the initial talk will look like this. Um, herpes simplex virus is not to be missed. That can give you a pneumonitis at day five of life without any other signs of, um, uh, of herpes simplex virus infections. So if the baby had pneumonitis on chest X-ray, um, day eight is not too late for the HSV to have been acquired at birth and be causing this. And so you need to make sure the baby hasn't got herpes simplex virus infection. And if you're suspicious, then treat with acyclovir, depending on how quickly you can get the test results. Chlamydia can present at this stage. I know it's classically two to six weeks, but it can present really very early, almost from day one onwards, chlamydia. So that's another one to at least think about. Now, but bacterial infection in a term baby, unless they've aspirated, is really quite rare. And if it's going to be anything, it's more likely to be Staphylococcus aureus or even Pneumococcus than it is to be Group B Streptococcus, particularly if this baby didn't have Group B Strep at birth. So late onset pneumonia like this is not usually Group B Strep. Many people say to me, ah, this baby is likely to have Group B Strep pneumonia. Not at day eight, is not. Okay, now, so for fungal infection, should I be thinking about that? Well, the major, major risk factor for neonatal fungal infection is extreme prematurity, and it's very rare in full-term infants. 
You can get it in full-term infants. And I was presented at a case um, in an Indian Congress one time. It was a mysterious case, and they were asking everyone what was going on. And a term baby who was asphyxiated got multiple different courses of antibiotics, very broad spectrum, and after two weeks, the baby developed systemic candida sepsis with brain abscesses. So that can happen, but it's very rare in full-term infants. So these are the data that we published from Australia, um, but other people have very similar data. This is the Australasian Society, um, uh, uh, Australasian, bloody hell, I started this group. Um, Australasian Study Group for Neonatal Infections. God, we've published lots of papers. And this is the data for 13 years. Um, and you can see but infants under 750 grams, by far the largest number of babies. These are babies under 1,000 grams, so 750 to 999. And these are 1,000 to 1,500, and we didn't have babies greater than that. Okay, and the gestational age, you can see so they're all preterm babies. We did not see any in term babies. Babies can occasionally be born with candida all over them. So this is a baby who's got been born with congenital candidiasis acquired from his mother. Horrible. Worse than the pictures that Vicente showed us. The other risk factors for neonatal fungal infection, fungal colonization, so you're not gonna get invasive fungal infection unless you're colonized first. Very broad spectrum antibiotics, third generation cephalosporins, the perinems, meropenem, the carbapenems, meropenem, imipenem, cylostatin. If you have gastrointestinal pathology necessitating prolonged parenteral nutrition, the prolonged parenteral nutrition contains sugars and fats that the, the fungi love, so that can be a risk factor. And if you suppress gastric acid with histamine antagonists, H2 antagonists, I should say. Okay, so if you do suspect fungal infection in a neonate, ophthalmoscopy is important. You might see these fungal balls there. Um, you should think about imaging the the renal tract because you can get lesions in the kidneys, although this is a CT scan showing them because I can never read ultrasounds and I hope you can't either. Um, I have to get someone else to do that. But an ultrasound is non-invasive and is sufficient to detect um, renal abscesses, renal candida abscesses. And brain abscesses like the baby I described to you who came from India and was presented at an Indian meeting and huge brain abscesses you can see here with fungus in them. Most babies with systemic fungal infection have no specific clinical features to help you with the diagnosis. They look like a baby with bacterial sepsis. If you look at the hematology, thrombocytopenia is common, but that also occurs in bacterial sepsis. And so just because you've got a baby with thrombocytopenia that you're worried about, your first thought would be bacterial sepsis, although you would have fungal sepsis at the back of your mind. Now, neutropenia is a risk factor for developing fungal infection. And now, neutropenia especially occurs in the few days after birth and is usually due to intrauterine growth retardation. Forgive me for not writing, spelling that out, but it was rather long, so I just thought I'd say I-U-G-R. And in 85% of babies with neutropenia in the first week of life, it's a growth-retarded baby and presumably placental insufficiency that's the cause. It can come on after two or three days, the thrombocytopenia, and then uh, the neutropenia, and then gradually resolves after a few days. If you are septic and neutropenic at the same time, then bacterial sepsis is more likely than fungal. So in terms of, just by the way, going back to this one, when we have babies who are neutropenic, for another cause, they're not septic but they're neutropenic, that actually is a high risk situation for developing bacterial infection. A, up to about 25% of these babies will develop sepsis. And it's the one situation when I think you should use prophylactic antibiotics. 
We put babies on antibiotics that will cover staph, so something like flucloxacillin or vancomycin even, and gram negatives. So gentamicin, you might need to use amikacin in this situation until the neutropenia has resolved, and then we stop them usually for four or five days. It's the only situation where I think true um, prophylactic antibiotics are warranted in the ne neonatal period. Otherwise, you're giving empiric treatment, treating until you know whether or not the baby's got sepsis. Okay, in terms of treatment, never ignore a positive blood culture for a fungus. Don't think it might be a contaminant even if a bacterium is also grown. I've done that twice in my life, and I still regret it, okay? Just said, oh, it might be a contaminant, repeat the cultures. Never do that with a neonate. Next thing, they'll have fungal meningitis, candida meningitis. So empiric treatment, so treat if you get fungus in a blood culture, it's real, okay? The other thing is that empiric treatment for fungal infection is occasionally necessary. You've got a baby who's been treated for bacterial sepsis, you're not growing anything. It's difficult to grow fungi in blood cultures and can take some days. So occasionally we do start empiric treatment. If we're going to start empiric treatment, we use amphotericin B. And conventional amphotericin is actually better in studies than liposomal amphotericin for newborns. So on current data, if we can get hold of it, and it's not always easy, then we would use conventional amphotericin empirically. It only happens perhaps twice a year. They say to me, I've got a baby, thrombocytopenic, a very preterm baby, under 1,000 grams. I'm worried about this baby. They don't seem to be getting better. And I'll say, I don't think we dare risk it. I agree with you. Let's start empiric fungal treatment until we know what's happening with cultures. And we do all the other things. We look in the eyes. We do the renal ultrasound. You could use fluconazole, which will treat pretty well all candida, not candida cruzii and not many candida glabrata. But as you'll see, those are the minority of candida infections. What about antifungal prophylaxis? This is different from antibacterial prophylaxis. Um, so I said you might use antibacterial prophylaxis for antibiotics, if you like, for neutropenic babies while they remain, if they've got transient neutropenia. But what about antifungal prophylaxis? We've looked at those babies and it was all the tiny babies that were getting it, wasn't it? You might think of using it for infants under 1,000 grams, under 1,250 grams, under 1,500 grams, and people have done all of these things at different times, and it's gonna depend on the frequency in your population of neonatal fungal infections. You might be selective and say babies that have been on broad spectrum antibiotics for th greater than three days, some people do that. Babies who've been on third generation cephalosporins, which have been particularly associated with a doubling in the risk of fungal infections. Or babies that you know are heavily colonized with candida. People have looked at all of these as possible ways of deciding who gets antifungal prophylaxis. And like everything in pediatrics, in, in medicine really, we're going to weigh up the benefits against the risks, aren't we? Okay, so if you're going to use antifungal prophylaxis, the possibilities for antifungal prophylaxis include fluconazole, which can give, be given orally or intravenously, nystatin, which is not absorbed. The name nystatin comes from New York State Institute, which was where it was developed. So that's why nystatin, yes? And that's not absorbed, and so we'll get rid of it from the gut, but not get into the bloodstream. Okay, which is interesting, isn't it? Because you're doing, you're saying that the candida is getting in through your gut, or possibly getting in through lines, but you heavy colonization in the gut, and if you can reduce that, then that might pre prevent fungal infections, okay? And then finally, there's the possibility of using amphotericin B. Okay, so let's just talk about those. Fluconazole prophylaxis, fluconazole is an azole antifungal, as the name suggests, it's well absorbed. 
The dose is six milligrams per kilogram given every three days or twice a week. And if the babies are tolerating oral, you can give oral because it's well absorbed. Um, and it's given oral IV recommended for 30 days to babies under 1,500 grams and by, for 45 days to babies under 1,000 grams. That's what's generally done in the studies that have been done. Okay, and here's the forest plot. I hope you can see that. And you know what I mean by a forest plot. So these are the different studies here, and this is the major plot here, and it shows that fluconazole reduces the risk of invasive fungal infections, which are almost all candida, by 64%. So the risk ratio is 0.36%, and it's significant because it doesn't go over one, and it's significant because it doesn't cross the one line here. Okay, so fluconazole works. A 64% reduction in fu systemic fungal infections. And I've said that again here, so the incidence was 6.1% in the fluconazole group. These were high-risk babies. 16.6% in the placebo group, and this is the risk ratio again. There was significant heterogeneity, so the studies were not all similar. The mortality was actually significantly reduced, just significant. You see it nearly reaches one. And the mortality was reduced by 32%. So the risk ratio is 0.68. Take that from 100, from 1, and that's 32% reduction. Okay, so a third of the babies are saved by giving fluconazole. There are some safety concerns. It could be hepatotoxic. If you use fluconazole all the time too much, you will induce resi resistance. There have been examples of Fluconazole resistant candida, colonizing babies throughout nurseries, reported from India and other countries. Um, and so non albicans candida will be selected. So it prevents fungal infections, it saves lives. And if you have a high incidence of fungal infection, then the number of babies you need to treat, NNT is the number needed to treat, to prevent one case of fungal infection, not one death, but it's one case, is eight. You have to treat eight babies to prevent one case of fungal infections in a baby under 1,500 grams, okay? If the incidence is low, and it's low in Australia, then you have to treat over 100 babies to prevent one case using fluconazole. If you restrict it to babies under 1,000 grams, you still have to treat 45 babies. So that's fluconazole. You have to weigh up whether you want to put all the babies on it, risk the toxicity to prevent those cases. Just because you can prevent infections doesn't mean you have to. You have to decide. Oral nystatin is what we use in Australia, much more than fluconazole. Not in the United States, they use fluconazole because they like things that are more expensive. It makes them feel better. Do you know that if you give someone, in, in the United States they did a study and they said this is the placebo, okay? So they said this is the drug, this is the placebo. And the placebo helps a bit, okay? But it helped more if you said the cost of the placebo was $5 than if you said the placebo was free. If you paid for it, it worked better. The placebo. <laughs> anyway, very interesting. So the Americans love their money, as you know, and uh, they make a lot of it. Okay, so the oral nystatin is a polyene antifungal drug, okay, and it's not absorbed, as I said, so it reduces colonization, and that's how it's preventing systemic infection. You give it orally, one mil, three times a day until the baby's well. So if they're not absorbing, if they've really got necrotizing endocolitis, you're, or you're worried about necrotizing endocolitis and they're not absorbing feeds, you're a bit reluctant to give nystatin, even though you're not wanting it to be absorbed anyway. But as soon as they're tolerating feeds, that's when we start oral nystatin. Okay, the studies here, um, 
There are not so many studies, okay, and they're heavily dominated by one Turkish study here with much bigger numbers than the others. But when you pool them, the re reduction in incidents is huge, 84% reduction in incidents. Okay, but it's much smaller numbers of studies than the fluconazole. So you see this 84% re reduction, but when you look at mortality, it actually doesn't quite reach significance. So smaller numbers of children studied with oral nystatin in randomized controlled trials. Still a 30% reduction, very similar. Do you remember it was 32% for fluconazole, but fluconazole just reached significance. Nystatin just doesn't quite. Okay, of the studies that have looked, compared fluconazole with nystatin, I hope you can read that, it's a bit gray, isn't it? Um, the relative risk was that fluconazole was actually better than nystatin, okay, but it didn't reach statistical significance. Okay, so in terms of mortality, fluconazole had a statistically significant 32% reduction, nystatin a statistically non-significant 39% reduction. So you've got to weigh up. Oral nystatin is much cheaper than fluconazole, much less toxic. It's not absorbed, so it has minimal toxicity. So in Australia, we use oral nystatin. Almost all our neonatal units have now been persuaded to use oral nystatin. Amphotericin B is used in some places intravenously as prophylactic um, antifungal. It's much more toxic and it's much more expensive. So the side effects of using amphotericin B are poverty, okay? So to prevent neonatal fungal infection, we saw a lovely slide earlier about what we should be doing with antibiotics, and this is fairly similar. You reduce broad-spectrum antibiotic use, so again it's a plea to use the narrowest spectrum antibiotics possible, particularly it seems third-generation cephalosporins are associated with systemic fungal infections. You start enteral feeds as early as you can. Um, you get the catheters out and use less total parenteral nutrition. Antifungal effect, prophylaxis is effective, and I recommend that you use it in high-risk neonates. So I'm talking about babies under 1,500 grams, certainly babies under 1,000 grams, and possibly babies with um, gastrointestinal um, impairment as well. Nystatin and fluconazole are both effective, and I suggest that you use oral nystatin when your incidence is low or cost is a significant issue. In the last few minutes, I was asked to just talk about one or two other possible interventions. So one of them was the role of intravenous immunoglobulins in prophylaxis and in treatment. So prophylactic intravenous immunoglobulins, so this is talking about giving them to all or to high-risk babies to prevent neonatal sepsis. There's a Cochrane review done in 2013, that's the most recent update of it, by Olson and Lacey, which shows a 3% reduction in neonatal sepsis with prophylactic intravenous immunoglobulin. A 4% reduction in one or more episodes of any serious infection, and no reduction in other clinically important outcomes, including mortality. So giving prophylactic intravenous immunoglobulin has not been shown to save lives. Although if you did a big enough study, presumably it would if you're truly reducing neonatal sepsis. So you have to treat 33 infections to prevent one infection. 33, sorry, 33 babies to prevent one infection with prophylactic intravenous immunoglobulin. And almost no one is doing this. It's too expensive and the 3% reduction is too uncertain. What about treating babies with intravenous immunoglobulin if they are septic, clinically septic? Should you start to treat them at the time that they become clinically septic? So there was a study called the IDIS study, 
which is a study, international neonatal immunotherapy study, which is giving intravenous immunoglobulin. Randomized study. Before that study, there were about 200 babies in, 280 babies in random, not about, there were exactly 280 babies in randomized controlled studies, and those showed a 50% reduction in mortality with intravenous immunoglobulin, but it did not reach statistical significance. Was it real or wasn't it? So, one of my colleagues, William Tana Mordi, from Sydney, originally from Dundee in Scotland. Um, I've got my Union Jack socks on today just to show that I'm originally English. Um, but we include Scotland in that. And William Tana Mordi, um, who's now in Sydney, actually right next door at Westmead Hospital, in the adult hospital, but he's a neonatologist there. And he started this study, and we managed to enroll international study, 3,493 infants with suspected bacterial sepsis, or suspected sepsis. And at the time that they were, had their suspected sepsis, they were randomized with consent from their parents, not from the babies, to intravenous immunoglobulin or placebo. Yes, not if you don't want me to give you, if you're a baby. Yes, okay, and this is the study. It took years to do, and at the end of the study, there was absolutely no difference whether you got intravenous immunoglobulin or placebo. And when I say no difference, the odds ratio was 0.95, okay? And it was crossed one, so it was 0.8 to 1.13. It really was a negative study. And William got these results, he wasn't telling me the results, he wasn't telling anyone the results, and he organized a meeting of all the people in the Blue Mountains. If you've been to the Blue Mountains, it's lovely and cool up there, it's like going to the Tal Volcano, but you don't have to take a horse to get up there. <laughs> and there was the meeting, and then he gave his figures, and it was a negative study. And everyone was devastated. All the people that had been in the study went, oh no, but that's terrible. And he said, no, it's not terrible. You need to know if you've got a treatment, an expensive treatment that doesn't work. Okay, so still now, sometimes my colleagues say to me, I've got this baby, the baby's doing really, really badly. Should I give intravenous immunoglobulin? And my answer is no. Babies sometimes get better, although they're doing really badly, and intravenous immunoglobulin is not gonna help them and it might harm them. And so you really should not. This is a really important result. The other thing is that that study, the INIS study, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it's difficult to get studies into the New England Journal of Medicine, into any journal, when they're negative. But if it's a real negative, you want to stop other people doing the studies again. You, it now becomes unethical to enroll babies in a randomized controlled study and spend money that's not necessary in that way. The other thing is, all my career, I'd wanted to get into the New England Journal of Medicine, and finally I got my name there. I was one of about 95 authors, and they spelt my name wrong. <laughs> Just as you've spelt it wrong the second talk I give. So it's still me. You, I've lost an S by the time I get to the second talk, but it's still me. I'm coming back tomorrow. Okay, so you don't give in that. Other adjunctive immunological interventions, probiotics. And I'm gonna end with this, just talking about pro probiotics. So I think this is really interesting. There's a Cochrane review with over 5,000 babies in randomized controlled trials. And if you give probiotics to infants under 1,500 grams from birth, you put the babies on probiotics, it prevents over half of all episodes of necrotizing enterocolitis. You can reduce the number of episodes of necrotizing enterocolitis by half. I should say it's associated with reduction. It's hard to prove that's true, and it may not be true all around the world. And in America, they've been very, in the United States, they've been very loath to give probiotics. But it also reduces all-cause mortality by over 60%. So it stops babies dying. What's more, breast milk 
protects babies against necrotizing enterocolitis. But it's additive on top of that. So you can give the babies breast milk, as we should be, but you can also give probiotics. They're incredibly cheap. They should be even cheaper. You can get them from the chemist for next to nothing, you know, from the health store food. Okay, and people have actually done that. One of the Canadian neonatologists has done that, goes to the healthcare food um, shop and buys the probiotics and gives it to the babies until he got in trouble for it. Okay, so this is the Cochrane review. It's a bit complicated, but you can see that there's a 43% reduction here in severe necrotizing enterocolitis with probiotics. All right? And there's a significant reduction in mortality by 61%. So that's this side of one, this line. Here's the one here. Okay? The trouble is which probiotic, and there are all different probiotics, and once you get into that, it gets very complicated. And it's whether you can get them licensed in your country. Do you use probiotics here? Good. Hooray. <laughs> And I don't know. And can you get, have you got one particular one that you can get hold of? Or you'd use different ones? It's a bit unsure whether it really makes any difference. But why do they work? Okay. Well, this is interesting. This is a non randomized study, but I think it's a really important study. And this one was published now nearly seven years ago by Dr. Cotton from the United States. And it's not a randomized control study, and it's not even a prospective study, it's a retrospective study. But they looked at 4,000 babies with birth weights under 1,000 grams. And all those babies had started early antibiotics, okay? Empiric antibiotics. And then their cultures were negative. All of these babies had negative blood cultures and systemic cultures. And they said, how long did these babies get treated with antibiotics? And I don't know about you, but we say, try and stop after two to three days. At the hospital that I work, after three days, 90% of babies have stopped antibiotics. Okay? So only 10% are still on antibiotics by day four. But here, in this American study, the babies were on antibiotics a median of five days. So they said, if that's the median, let's look at babies who got less than five days of antibiotics and compare it with babies who got five or more days of antibiotics. And if you had five, remember, all of these babies have got negative cultures. And so if someone's scared, it's a tiny baby, ooh, it's a bit sick, I'll keep going with antibiotics. Well, the babies got, got longer had an increase, a 50% increased risk of dying. Now, that's not to say that it might be that they're different, you know, they're, it's not randomized, so there may be inherent differences, but prolonged antibiotics was associated with an increased risk of dying. And what's more, with an increased risk of necrotizing enterocolitis. So if you want to put that very similar to the data from probiotics, but in reverse almost, isn't it? So probiotics reduced dying by 50%, not dying from necrotizing enterocolitis, but dying all cause, and probiotics reduced necrotizing enterocolitis by about the same. Why do people choose five days? Well, we, we have magical numbers, don't we? We treat anti with antibiotics for a five-day course or a seven-day course because we have five fingers and five toes, most of us. And unless you've got polydactyly and then you're in trouble. And seven days in a week and so on. So these are magical numbers and they're multiples of five and seven usually, no? You think about it, always, all the studies, they don't say a six day course, or an eight day course, unless you're the Beatles, okay? But seven. Okay, so my hypothesis is that broad-spectrum antibiotics, especially if prolonged, they harm the microbiome, the normal gut flora, and alter your normal gut flora. We know that's true. And that prophylactic, and prophylactic probiotics may reverse the harm that's being done by broad-spectrum antibiotics, allowing us to misbehave with the antibiotics. So you're better to do 
not go prolonged antibiotics if you can, perhaps still give probiotics because they're so safe, okay, and will reduce necrotizing enterocolitis even more. So my conclusions in this talk, and I've got one minute left, so I've timed it just about right, are to use prophylactic antifungals for the highest risk babies, use prophylactic probiotics as you do, I hear, if you can, select your babies, the highest risk babies, under 1,500 grams, and to use antibiotics wisely. And this is the advantage of living in Australia. And Wednesday is Charlie Day. This is Charlie, now nearly two. And I'm missing him for you, so you have to thank me for coming to see you. And I thank you. <laughs>